chaos and the dumbest bill in America. This is Mark Fisher with Mark and the Millennials and the Millennial. Joining me today is, of course, Christopher Hopkins, our producer on the other side of the camera. Welcome, everyone, to this episode of Mark and the Millennials, which is called Chaos. Chaos, because that is what the Democrat Party in the United States of America seems to be causing in every aspect of life. And we're going to go into that in some detail. But of course, the left is also doing the same thing, that is to say, creating chaos in Europe as well. We have the most extraordinary story that just came out today. I mean, the most extraordinary story. And that story is titled, No Electric Cars in Switzerland. Think about this, ladies and gentlemen. You live in Europe. It's just like living in California, Western Europe. They want everybody to own an electric car. Because, naturally, the climate, it's the climate crisis. You must have an electric car. And now, in Switzerland, the Swiss are saying, we are considering banning electric car use. The Swiss are considering banning electric car use. They're already asking you to drive less with your electric car. They're hoping you don't drive it at all. But they're actually considering banning the use of your electric car altogether among power cuts because of the European energy crunch. (laughs) This is in the Epic Times. Switzerland is mauling banning the use of electric cars in the nation for non-essential purposes. Think about that. Remember during the pandemic, you had the essential workers and the non-essential workers? Now in Switzerland, they're saying if you are a non-essential, if you're engaging in non-essential purposes, whatever that is, you can't use your electric car. And Swiss are using other measures and considering other measures in a bid to save energy as the European region grapples with an ongoing energy crisis. During a recent press conference, federal counselor Guy Parmelin announced the decision to curtail energy use among Swiss citizens. According to the Swiss newspaper, 20 Minuten, people will be asked to make voluntary savings. And if that is not enough, the federal council in Switzerland will begin implementing its restrictions and stages. The first level of restrictions will cover night lights, kitchens, and washing machines. In the second stage, heating will be limited to certain places like Mini bars at hotels. What? Heating will be limited to certain places like mini bars at hotels? I don't understand what that even means, but that's what it says here. In the third stage, when the country will start getting into hard times, shops will be shut down for an hour a day. At this level, the private use of cars will be permitted only for necessary journeys like shopping, attending religious events, professional practice, visiting doctors and so on, in addition, a speed limit on the motorway of 100 uh, kph, or what really is 62 miles per hour, is also under consideration. In the fourth stage, the government will impose a strict ban on venues like cinemas, leisure parks, casinos, sports facilities, and cultural events. Ladies and gentlemen, what we're talking about here is a country that was all in on electric vehicles, and now suddenly they're telling you You can't use your electric vehicle. And I'm not sure if you remember this, but this same exact thing happened at, I guess, the end of August, mid-August, end of August in California, where the governor of California, Gavin Newsom, he said in August, look, we're having a heat wave and we know that you want to use your AC, but we might have to actually limit your use of electricity. And that's because in California... They are all in on what? Electric electric cars. But at the same time, you can't generate electricity in California unless you use wind and solar. Or you have to get special permission to have natural gas plants or oil-fired plants or a nuclear plant. Which, of course, they want to get rid of all those and just go strictly wind and solar. And I think that the takeaway from this is it's pretty fascinating, too. When you have a government that is prescriptive about the energy that you use, 
or prescriptive about anything that you can use. In other words, we're being prescriptive. You must have an electric car. You can't have a combustible engine car that uses gasoline. When you're prescriptive about that, you basically, as a government, can control every aspect of human movement at that particular point in time. A government that controls basically your electricity. I mean, everything is electric. That's what they're moving towards, of course, in, in Switzerland, as well as the West, the rest of Western Europe. They want everything to, to run on electric, just like they want in New York City and just like they want in California. And then when there's a problem with that one source of prescriptive energy, then the entire economy is in trouble. The entire economy. And the takeaway here is that policymakers made this mistake. It was the policy of Switzerland to move towards an all-electric economy. It wasn't the citizens. And the same thing in the United States. We have the same Democrat Party, the same libs, far left, just like in Switzerland. You know, they, the, the woke crowd. Everything must be electric, according to the Democrats. In my home state of Maryland, the Democrat Party, one of the leaders in the General Assembly, literally told me, and he was, quite frankly, very, very honest, at least, about his intent. He goes, make no mistake about it, Mark, is what he told me. He says, we will be getting rid of natural gas in the state of Maryland. Think about that. They're already getting rid of coal, but he's like, we will be getting rid of natural gas. We will be an all-electric economy in the state of Maryland. And that's what they want in California and Illinois and New York and all of the other blue states. But also in Europe, they're actually ahead of us on becoming all electric. And they had no alternative ideas when things went wrong. Like, remember, with electricity, you actually have to have electric generation plants, plants that actually create electricity in order to run that electricity over the grid. And they became dependent on Russia. But is that Russia's fault that Europe became dependent upon Russia? No. It's the policy idiots in Europe. It's their fault. Because the issue isn't that there is a lack of oil or natural gas. The issue is that there are a lot of stupid people running the countries in Western Europe. In Germany in particular obviously in Switzerland, but throughout Europe. And so I just want to continue with this article a little bit because it's interesting. It says Europe's biggest economies, like Germany and France, are also reportedly struggling with power supplies. In October, Germany's Federal Network Agency, which regulates electricity and gas in the country, stated that it was possible the nation will run out of gas before the winter season ends. To avoid the shortage, Germany will have to cut down its gas use by at least 20%. Get sufficient deliveries of liquefied natural gas, probably from the United States, and ensure that exports are relatively low. If any of these factors fail to line up, Germany would see gas running out by February, the agency warned. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz insisted that the energy crisis was under control. <laughs> Meanwhile, it's the policymakers in Germany that, and of course, France, but primarily Germany and elsewhere in Europe, that caused these issues. It wasn't the people. It wasn't the people. And certainly, <laughs> the idea that Russia has caused this crisis, I, I have to underscore this, ladies and gentlemen. Because this is the conventional wisdom now in the United States. It's Russia. Russia is the one that's causing the energy crisis in Western Europe and Eastern Europe. To which any reasonably intelligent person would say, why did you ever become dependent upon Russian energy to begin with? Why? Well, because of the fact that they weren't allowed to use the energy in their own countries because that made them, you know, really sensitive to the climate. But it was okay to become dependent upon 
natural gas producers and oil producers outside of Switzerland and outside of Germany and outside of France. And now you have Switzerland saying, don't use your electric cars. First, they said, remember, first they said, you have to buy an electric car if you want to be acceptable and be, you know, part of the mainstream of society. You cannot use those polluting gasoline cars. So you go and you think you're doing the right thing. Oh, I'm going to go buy an electric car because I'm actually so sensitive. You go buy your electric car and then the government's like, well, now we don't have enough, enough electricity to power your car. <laughs> and then you're like, well, wait a minute. You told me to buy an electric car because it's better for the climate. I bought an electric car and then you failed to prepare the grid as well as the electric generation plants with sufficient electricity to provide us with that power. And now you're saying it's Russian's fault. You see what I'm saying here, ladies and gentlemen? This is, this is the way the left operates. This is the way they move. It's, it's can't be, it can't be their fault. It's your fault. It's Russia's fault. How dare you use so much electricity? <laughs> And before that, it was, how dare you use so much, you know, gasoline or natural gas? You know, don't buy any electric grills, which we're going to get to that in a moment from Janet Yellen. It's almost hard to believe. And so in the United States, what we know is that the Biden administration, this is the Daily Caller, says they drained the strategic petroleum reserve to save the global economy. Sure. The Biden administration's International Energy Affairs Advisor, Amos Hochstein, said Monday on CNBC's Squawk Box that the administration drained the strategic petroleum reserve in part to save the global economy. Host Joe Kernan noted the Biden administration consistently accused oil companies of price gouging. But since gas prices have dropped, the administration has moved away from that talking point. Quote, so if oil companies and refineries were able to control the prices and gouge and profiteering at the highest levels, why does the Biden administration get credit when the market forces take over and they do come down, Kernan asked, adding whether they just say this stuff to their base. And so this article continues, and as you guys can imagine, the Biden administration's basically saying, well, we took them the oil out of the strategic petroleum reserve because we wanted to flood the market with, with oil to make sure that the price went down and at the same time to help our good friends in Europe, I presume that's what they mean by this. Yet the policies of the Biden administration are exactly the same as the policies of Western Europe, namely, namely that we cannot use natural gas or oil or coal, we have to use only electricity. And that electricity must only be generated from so-called renewable sources of solar and wind. And so this is a warning shot to the citizens of the United States. Policy does matter, but so does accountability, which of course, it's why we're calling this podcast chaos, because I feel like the left across the planet is invoking chaos in their economies. And then, of course, there's no accountability. They're just blaming everybody else. It can't be them. It can't be what they've caused, because what they're trying to make you believe, ladies and gentlemen, is that we're running out of things. We're running out of electricity. And that's because of the climate crisis. No, we're running out of electricity. Because you didn't plan properly. There's plenty of electricity to be generated if you actually knew how to do your job as a policymaker. There's actually plenty of oil and gas and natural gas, too, to operate your combustible engine. So no sooner do they tell you to do the right thing, and then, you know, here they are ripping you and trying to control your lives. And basically saying, I'm going to turn your thermostat down. By the way, you should consider this too. If you have an all-electric economy, 
Do you know what a smart meter is? A smart meter is very convenient for the power company because the power company no longer has to send out what? They don't have to send out the meter readers. The meter readers were the, the guys that would, you know, go in the power company vehicle and they'd actually have to drive up to your meter or get out of their car and walk over to the meter that's on your house and read the meter. And then that's how the power company knew what to charge you. Well, the power companies decided a number of years ago to implement smart meters. And so that enabled the power companies to eliminate an entire class of employee, namely the meter readers. They're all gone, all gone. And in theory, the power company then saves money and in theory passes that savings to you in theory. But here's the point. A smart meter also, ladies and gentlemen, could allow the power company to power down your house. You can no longer have the setting in the wintertime at 71 degrees. You can only use a certain amount of electricity. You are only allocated a certain amount of electricity. These things matter. These things matter. This is why when a government is prescriptive about what kind of power you can use, what kind of energy you're allowed to purchase, you should be really, really skeptical. You should really not trust your government. And they have proven this, the left has, across the planet, that they cannot manage the very basic things in, in government that government is supposed to be doing, like making sure there is enough energy for the citizens to live and prosper. And so Janet Yellen, you know, Janet Yellen, incredible. What does she say about this? Well, Janet Yellen blames Americans because the Americans were splurging during, and, which, and that caused record high inflation, but they're still splurging, according to Janet Yellen. <laughs> it's hard to believe. Um, she said in this interview with Stephen Colbert, she said, first of all, it's Russia's fault. And then in another question, she says, well, it's actually the American people's fault. You know, it's, it's actually your fault. I think this first clip exchange is where she says it's Russia's fault, if I'm correct. But this is remarkable, ladies and gentlemen, because once again, no accountability, right? No accountability for their policies, which have caused a lack of supply of energy in the United States of America, and at the same time, their spending policies, which have caused inflation. And here you have Janet Yellen blaming you. So it says here, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen blamed consumers for excess, spend, excess spending habits as a primary cause for the 40-year high inflation. She just did this. The Treasury Secretary of the United States says, it's your fault. It's your fault. So we have this clip where Stephen Colbert, who's from the late night show, Stephen Colbert, um, he asks her a question. And first we have the question, and then we have her response. Here's the question. Here it is. Are we headed for a recession? Because your counterpart in England says that they're already in recession, and it's going to be the longest one since the Great War. And so that's the question. Stephen Colbert gives to Janet Yellen, are we in recession? And here is Yellen's response. Here it is. So I believe there is a path to bringing inflation down while maintaining a strong, healthy labor market. Do you think it's possible we're not heading into a recession? Yes. I, we had a rapid recovery. Growth has slowed down. I expect the pace of job creation to slow down. That's natural and expected when the unemployment rate is close to the lowest in 50 years. So I think we can take the heat out of the economy. And remember, Russia has conducted a brutal war against Ukraine, and that caused uh, gas prices to spike. It's caused food prices to spike. It's creating hardship all over the world. And um, we're really trying to address those 
those strains as well. That's another reason inflation went up and we're trying to hold that down. It's Russia's fault, Janet Yellen says. The U.S. Treasury Secretary says to Stephen Colbert, it's Russia's fault because they invaded the Ukraine. And when Russia did that, suddenly there wasn't enough of everything. To suddenly, out of the blue, you didn't have enough of anything to buy anymore. So it was Russia. It wasn't the policymakers' fault because, you know, it wasn't, after all, the fact that they spent trillions of dollars under the Biden administration, and also, quite frankly, Trump did as well during the pandemic and the pandemic response. And Biden, of course, continued the process with spending another three, $3 trillion. We have all this money flooding the economy with the federal government buying stuff, building stuff, competing against the private sector. Too much money, chasing too few goods, but it's Russia's fault. Of course, it's the Ukraine. It's the invasion of Russia, of Ukraine. It's their fault. And how is that any different, which is why I played this for you, ladies and gentlemen, how's that any different than Switzerland saying, it's your fault. You know, you're just using too much electricity for your electric car and for your heaters and in your kitchen and your washing machine. Come on, you got to cut back on that stuff. It's your fault that we don't have enough electricity. And we have the United States government saying the same thing. It's your fault that things cost so much. How dare you? First of all, it's Russia. But then we have another exchange with Yellen and Colbert where she literally says, you know, indirectly or directly, you tell me what you think. But she says, it's your fault. Listen to this question from Colbert to Janet Yellen. Here it is. It's great. You've been called a genius at explaining arguments oh, no, no, simply no. and clearly. Others have said this. I know you haven't said this to yourself, but are you explaining arguments simply and clearly? Can you explain how oh, inflation else? got so high? Because two years ago, everything seemed fine. Uh, even in 2021, you and other members of the administration believed that inflation was a small risk. What happened uh, simply and clearly. So there you have Colbert asking in the second round of questions to Janet Yellen, what happened with this whole inflation thing? You know, why didn't you know about this? And of course, you guys heard last podcast that Jerome Powell said that no one could have predicted that inflation was going to be so bad. But Yellen has a different, she has a different idea about this. You won't believe her response, ladies and gentlemen. Here is her response. Here's Janet Yellen. So, We had a rapid recovery from the pandemic. When President Biden was elected, unemployment was quite high. It was close to 7%. And we put policies in place that generated a very rapid recovery. Unemployment quickly fell back into the threes. Where is Um, it now? Where is it now? Three, seven. Okay. So normally you wouldn't expect, um, just because you had a rapid recovery, Uh, for inflation to rise very much, if at all. But it turned out the pandemic had very special impacts on the economy. Remember, everybody stopped spending on services. They were in their homes for a year or more. Um, They wanted to buy grills and office furniture. They were working from home. Mm. They suddenly started splurging on goods, buying Technology, um, you know, we were suddenly working through technology. And bottlenecks started developing where supply in particular important sectors of the economy just couldn't keep up with demand. That's what your Treasury Secretary thinks about you. Chris just said, how dare you buy things with your own money? Screw you. I mean, literally, that was why I had to play this clip for you, ladies and gentlemen, because... I was so enraged when I heard Janet Yellen say this. Namely, well, consumers started buying grills and then they were working from home. And then they bought office furniture and then they bought some technology, I guess, presumably she means like laptops and like maybe a printer so that they could work from home. That caused the inflation. In other words, it's your fault. The deplorables stop buying grills. (laughs) <laughs> How dare you, deplorables? How dare you work from the home and buy stuff? 
no responsibility of this government. And Janet Yellen is on the left, ladies and gentlemen, believe me, far left. No responsibility taken by this government about how much money they have pumped into the economy. No real critical thinking skills. And of course, Stephen Colbert, you know, he he premises the question like, everybody says you're brilliant. (laughs) Of course, naturally, you've got a lefty interviewing a lefty about one of the greatest economic crises that we have seen and will see, by the way, because so many experts are saying that this particular recession and inflationary period could last years, okay? Obviously, I hope it doesn't. But Yellen is like, well, it's only happening because the deplorables are buying grills. (laughs) How, How dare they do that? It's government that should be buying things. That's why government's spending all this money. Only the government's allowed to buy stuff, not the consumers, not the citizens. That's, ladies and gentlemen, when you know you're not being governed, you're being ruled. I really believe this now. I believe we are being ruled, not governed. And these are individuals that truly believe that any kind of sacrifice that you make is meaningless, and that government should just continue to grow and grow and grow and just crowd out the private sector. And you heard, first of all, with this chaos they've created, you know, you got Switzerland saying, buy electric cars, now don't drive them because there isn't enough electricity. You have Yellen saying it's Russia's fault that there isn't enough oil or gas, which is utter nonsense. Because why would, you, why would you or anyone else be dependent about, upon, of all countries, Russia? You wouldn't. It's dumb. That's a policymaker decision. Why would you be dependent upon your supply chain being controlled through China? You ought not. That's a policymaker decision. So our policymakers on the left and the right, quite frankly, have allowed this nonsense to happen. However, the most recent spending that has occurred, the $3 trillion under Joe Biden, there's no doubt that has caused the inflation. Without question, that is the root cause of inflation. Without question. And then you have your Treasury Secretary saying, stop buying grills. I mean, that to me, I just, when you see someone like this, you just want to You really just, you just can't wait for the next election. You know, I mean, that's really, that's all we have, right? The next election is to try to throw these people out. So next up, podcast listeners, we have a really interesting story. And that is the former Twitter executive who was a head of trust and safety. (laughs) Imagine, imagine you're in a social media company or that you are a media company, like you you produce a newspaper, an online newspaper, or an online magazine, and you have an executive whose job it is and title is head of trust and safety. (laughs) Well, the former Twitter trust and safety head defends his decision to ban the Babylon Bee. (laughs) So... Guys, look, this is really funny. We have a clip. Okay, I'll play the clip in a minute, but I have to set this up. Imagine the Babylon Bee is a satire site, a a site based on satire. In other words, humor. They make fun of the right and they make fun of the left. And it's all in a funny way. And the idea is for you to laugh at yourself. And, And this guy, Yoel Roth, the former head of Twitter's trust and safety department said last week that he defended Twitter's controversial banning of the Babylon Bee earlier in 2022 for misgendering the assistant secretary of health, Rachel Levine, a biological male who identifies as a female. So in other words, because the Babylon Bee wrote a satirical piece on this guy who dresses like a woman 
who happens to be in a position of authority as the assistant secretary of health. Yeah, I still find it so funny because, you know, it's like, why don't we put him in assistant secretary of mental health? You know, that would be even make more sense. But this executive, Joe Roth, I digress. Joe Roth basically says that he made the right decision to ban Babylon B. In other words, he didn't take down the article that Babylon B wrote that was a, a comedic article about Rachel Levine. No, he took down Babylon B, the entire site off of Twitter. So he was interviewed, and we have the clip where he talks about this. You cannot believe it. Listen, here it is. Okay, Babylon B, which is what got him to buy the thing, I think. That's the that's it's the, the one which is which was not particularly funny. The Babylon Bee's man of the year is Rachel Levine. <laughs> not funny. Yeah. Um, and, and you can ask I didn't her. agree they should have taken that down, but go ahead. You know, it's interesting. Uh, it's interesting to think about what the competing tensions around that are. And I, I want to start by acknowledging that um, the targeting and the victimization of the trans community on Twitter is very real very life-threatening and extraordinarily serious. Um, we have seen from a number of Twitter accounts, including libs of TikTok notably, that there are orchestrated campaigns that particularly are singling out a group that is already particularly vulnerable within society. And so, yeah, not only is it not funny, but it is dangerous and it does contribute to an environment that makes people unsafe in the world. So let's start from a premise that it's fucked up. But then, again, let, let's look at what Twitter's written policies are. Twitter's written policies prohibit misgendering, full stop. And the Babylon Bee, in the name of satire, misgendered Admiral Rachel Levine. Twitter satire. Nominally, but it's still misgendering. Okay. And, you know, you can, there can be a very long and, and academic discussion of, of satire and sort of the lines there. Interestingly, uh, Apple try to tease out this question of satire and political commentary in their own guidelines, which I think are, are also fraught. But, you know, we landed on the side of enforcing our rules okay. as written. And that's how it got bought by Elon Musk, just in case you're interested. Um, he was mad about that. I remember that. <laughs> so, right. That was Kara Swisher. She was the podcaster. Okay, the lady. She was interviewing Roth. And um, Yo Roth, of course, who was the head of trust and safety at Twitter before he was summarily let go because Elon Musk took over the co company. And Kara Swisher says, well, the whole reason why Musk bought Twitter is because you, Yul Roth, took down the Babylon Bee, the satire site, off of Twitter. That's why Musk bought it. And these people have, like, no sense of humor. They're so righteous. They have no sense of humor whatsoever because... Look, ladies and gentlemen, it is funny what Babylon B did. They said that the man of the year is Rachel Levine, right? <laughs> because Rachel Levine is a man. Rachel Levine is not a woman. Rachel Levine dresses as a woman and identifies a woman as a woman. And Rachel Levine has every right to do that in a free society, by the way. But the idea that the everyday American has to buy into this idea that we have to call Dr. Levine a woman. I'm sorry. I have, look, <laughs> as long as you are respectful, okay, which I think is, but you're, you should also laugh too. And by respectful, I mean, this is not a woman. This is a man. This man is dressed as a woman. Why can't we talk about the truth? Okay. Why can't we just speak truthfully about this? But according to Yoel Roth at Twitter, this is considered misgendering. What I just said would be misgendering. In other words, under Twitter 1.0, had I said that on Twitter, I would have been banned from Twitter. Had I said that as an employee of Twitter, I probably would have been fired from Twitter. Namely, if I said something sim simple like this, well, you know, Dr. Rachel Levine is actually a man, a biological man, who is dressing as a woman. I can guarantee you 
that that would be considered misgendering, according to Yol Roth. And had he known about it, he would have told HR at Twitter and HR would have fired you. Just for saying that. This is ridiculous. This is ridiculous where corporate America is today. And not just corporate America, but of course, the media. And then you have the podcaster, Kara Swisher, basically saying, well, I don't think that was funny. That wasn't funny. It wasn't funny when Babylon B said that that was the 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 man of the year. I mean, it's ridiculous that these people can't laugh at satire, right? That actually is funny because it's a sign of the times and a sign of how we're getting dumber in the United States. We're getting dumber by the day. So the reason we're reading this to you, the reason why we're talking about this latest update about Twitter is because Yo Roth, this incredibly effeminate man who gets on this podcast, still is maintaining that he had the right and we collectively as a society have the right to ban people from social media for telling jokes, <laughs> for, t- <laughs> for joking, for engaging in comedy, for having an opinion. that there are speech codes and the speech codes are only the speech codes as divine as defined by a Joel Roth, Joel Roth, excuse me. And those speech codes can must be followed or you could lose your job or you could lose your presence on social media just by misgendering somebody. I mean, Chris, help me out here. What am I missing? Like, I, I feel like this is a complete and utter fabrication of the millennial generation. You know, it's like, oh, you know, it's like speech codes, misgendering, you know, it's like, no. Um, if I met Dr. Rachel Levine, right? I Here's what I would say. I would say, hi, Dr. Levine. It's nice to meet you. Okay. Cause it's yeah. a doctor, right? Yeah. Sure. Um, fair enough. Right. That's respectful. But this, but in the same since if I'm not allowed to laugh at the Babylon B title, this this is the man of the year. What was really government and Twitter have conspired together and they're telling me I can't have a sense of humor? This is where we are. This is where we are. And so the Twitter revelations and transparency has really just started. And Elon Musk has just released a statement saying, yes, I'm going to release much more information because unless we come clean on everything that has happened in the past, we cannot be trusted moving forward. So in the Daily Caller, ladies and gentlemen, Nicholas Sandman says he wonders if Elon Musk has any Twitter files on all of the death threats that he received. So former Covington Catholic high school student Nicholas Sandman told Elon Musk on Sunday that he wonders if Twitter has any hidden files related to the death threats made against him and his classmates. Quote, as I'm watching this all play out, I'm wondering if Elon Musk has any hidden Twitter files relating to what went on here, Sandman tweeted to the owner of Twitter. Let's be clear, under the watch of Vijaya, at Vijaya, which was, of course, one of the censors at Twitter that's no longer there, they allowed these illegal threats when I was 16 years old. So the threats, ladies and gentlemen, are as follows. Quote, and these were tweeted threats, okay? Lock the kids in the school and burn that bitch to the ground, one tweet by user at House Shoe said. Another, by the same account, said, fire on any of these red hat bitches when you see them on site. These are children, by the way, that they are referring to, this red hat, this red shoes or house shoes person said. Another account tweeted, hashtag MAGA kids, go screaming hats first into the wood chipper. Musk released internal emails to journalist Matt Taibbi documenting how the company censored the New York Post's 
Hunter laptop story. So this was Nicholas Sandman, of course, because as you recall, ladies and gentlemen, Nicholas Sandman was the gentleman who was on the mall of the Capitol with the Covington Catholic High School students. These are all minors. This was a number of years ago. And all they were doing was doing a visit. They were visiting Washington, D.C. They were tourists with their Catholic high school. And then he was randomly, at least it appears randomly, approached by a Native American who, I guess, was what was what was happening there again? He was he, he was kind of just like make, just like talking at like Nick Sandman didn't do anything. Yeah, he was just standing there yeah. watching this gentleman. This gentleman was engaging in like Native I, American I have, ceremonial sure. stuff or yeah, something like that. But he but but Sandman was just smiling. And he was said, smiling, but he wasn't saying anything yeah. and he wasn't being disrespectful. And he said he was mocking him or something. And so why does this matter? It matters because Sandman's like, hey, look, I was 16 years old when this happened and Twitter lit up with people who were not just criticizing me, but threatening me, like threatening to kill me and encouraging others to threaten to kill me. And yet, where were the censors under Twitter point 1.0, where were they then? And ladies and gentlemen, this is why Yo Roth and Vijaya, why these two individuals who, of course, are no longer at Twitter. But this is why these two individuals are so insincere. Because when they talk about Twitter 1.0 and how they censored people, they're... They're so virtuous. They're so superior to you. They're so important. You're such a nothing. And they're worried about misgendering because it's dangerous. And then at the same time, a minor is threatened. And people are literally encouraging others to hurt the minor and kill he and his classmates. And Twitter left all of those tweets up, ladies and gentlemen. And so we can only hope, we can only hope that moving forward, we actually have Twitter 2.0, which just lets it go. By that, I mean, let the conversation go. Let it, let it continue. Let the thread go. Let people say what they want to say. And obviously, we know that there are exceptions. You can't encourage people to kill someone or to hurt someone. Obviously, I think that makes sense to take that kind of thing down. I think we would all agree. But humor? So also breaking, former Twitter censor criticizes Elon Musk for exposing him in the Hunter Biden files. <laughs> So, Yo Roth, whom we just spoke about, he was the former head of trust and safety for Twitter, has expressed his displeasure on a new social media platform called Mastodon, which I haven't heard of, after Elon Musk released the bombshell evidence about Twitter censorship of the Hunter Biden laptop scandal, according to the Post Millennial. The so called Hunter Biden files were released by Musk and published by Matt Taibbi on Twitter that, among other things, revealed that Roth participated in censoring the Hunter Biden laptop story by the New York Post, publicly posting the names, and this is Yo Roth saying this, you'll love it, quote, publicly posting the names and identities of frontline Twitter employees involved in content moderation puts them in harm's way, and it, and it is a fundamentally unacceptable thing to do, Yo Roth posted on Mastodon. This is interesting, right? Talk about things coming full circle. So here's a guy that allows Nicholas Sandman to be threatened on Twitter. Doesn't take it down. Takes down the Hunter Biden laptop story, which threatens the United States of America by the Biden crime family because information wasn't readily available to the voters to make a transparent and honest decision about who to vote for. 
And now this guy, Yo Roth, is saying, well, yeah, that may be true that I did all of those things, but you shouldn't tell people who I am because it puts me in harm's way. How so? I know of no one, and I would also encourage no one, to ever say that this Yo Roth guy should in any way, shape, or form, you know, engage to have someone hurt him. Of course, that would be, you know, that doesn't make any sense. But he's worried about getting hurt, probably because he's so daggone, you know, unintelligent and at the same time dishonest. What he should be more concerned about is not that. What he should be concerned about is, you know, being sued and or maybe going to jail. I'm not sure what the crime would be, actually, because I guess he can hide behind the Twitter policies. You know, oh, the policies were really good policies because, you know, we uh, we were just following company policy and the company policy was stated that we get to de- we get to interpret what is good and what is bad. But think about this. Yo Roth saying that the content moderation disclosures by Elon Musk are putting him in harm's way. That somehow that is scary for him. Folks, this is when you know that when you put the left in the limelight and you shine the light on what they are doing, that they can't take the heat. They cannot take the heat. They can only be manipulative and they can only create chaos in darkness. As soon as you expose them to light, They're terrified, and they run away as fast as they possibly can. And that really is the takeaway from this this latest Yo Roth disclosure on Twitter. (laughs) He's incapable of laughing at the Babylon Bee. They have to be banned. Incapable of taking down tweets that threaten Nicholas Sandman, but perfectly capable of taking down tweets about stories relating to the Biden crime family's involvement in the Ukraine prior to Joe Biden becoming president of the United States and in China through Hunter Biden's various business dealings. Pretty extraordinary. Now we have the same guy, Yo Ross, saying, well, he's in danger now because we're actually finding out what the actual truth was on Twitter through Elon Musk. Absolute nonsense. Freedom of speech, transparency is always a good thing. If you can't take it, then you ought not be involved in trying to censor people to begin with. And that's the last word for Mark and the Millennials. Thank you for joining Mark and the Millennials. This is Mark Fisher. Thank you to our producer, Christopher Hopkins. Check us out on iTunes, Spotify, Twitter 2.0, YouTube, Facebook, Getter, True Social, Rumble, and our website. See you next time.